Hello, good morning. My name is Maaz Malah. I'm the Director of Cardiovascular Path at the Houston Methodist Cardiovascular Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Cardiovascular Grand Rounds at Houston Methodist Ibeke Cardiovascular Center. We're honored today to have Dr. Marcelo Di Carli with us, who is the Executive Director of Cardiovascular Imaging and the Chief of Cardiovascular of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's also Professor of Radiology and Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Di Carli received his MD from University of Buenos Aires, and he did his nuclear, he did his internal medicine and cardiology training over in Buenos Aires, followed by uh, nuclear medicine training at UCLA. He's currently the chair of the American College of Cardiology Cardiovascular Imaging Council. Dr. Di Carli is a very well recognized clinician, scientist, and teacher. He received many awards from the American Heart Association and Society of Nuclear Medicine. He also received multiple NIH grants and has been the founding editor of Circulation Cardiovascular Imaging between 2008 and 2018. He's been also the associate editor of multiple journals, including Circulation, Journal of Nuclear Cardiology, and Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. He has more than 200 publications in multiple journals, and he has been also the uh, author of the imaging chapter for the Harrison Internal Medicine textbook. Uh, Dr. Di Carli is also the uh, program director of the NIH T32 cardiovascular imaging training at the Brigham and Women Hospital where many of us trained for over the past many years, and many of his trainees are now in success uh, in this well-established clinical research and academic careers. Dr. Dikali is going to talk to us about cardiovascular PET and where does it fit in our cardiovascular management of patients with coronary disease. Welcome, Marcelo. Thank you, Moaz. And uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Bill, for this great honor uh, uh, to present today with you. Uh, I apologize that uh, uh, you know we couldn't be here, we couldn't be there in person, um, but uh, hopefully, uh, so we will be able to see each other uh, in the near future. Uh, let me just see if I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you just need to move your Zoom window, yes. Okay. All right. So um, it's a great honor uh, to be presenting to you today. And as Moaz uh, mentioned, I will be um, discussing some of the developments in cardiovascular PET. Uh, much of this content will become um, sort of a, a, a nice review from uh, what you've already learned from Dr. Almala uh, already at uh, uh, Houston Methodist. So um, before I start with that, I want to mention a couple of things about the field of nuclear cardiology. And this is a field that has evolved over many decades it's been almost 50 years since the introduction of the myocardial perfusion scan by doctors Zaret and uh, Strauss. Uh, I still hear a lot of voices, so I'm not sure. Can you hear me well? Yes, we Hello? can hear you. Okay, all right. Now, th there's voices uh, in the background. The Zoom short ribbon on the lower part of the slide, if you can take it off or maybe put it on the top where it says share, yeah. Yeah. So um, as I said, uh, the field of nuclear cardiology and myocardial perfusion imaging pretty much started uh, almost 50 years ago. And uh, back then, uh, doctors Zaret and Strauss described um, the 
basically two patterns that have been used over the decades uh, uh, for managing patients with coronary disease, including that ischemia correspond to reversible perfusion defects and the scar corresponds to fixed perfusion abnormalities. You know, the techniques have changed over the ensuing decades, but the concepts of defect reversibility and defect uh, non-reversibility continue to be the bedrock of what we do uh, in nuclear cardiology and in clinical cardiology. So it has really transformed the way in which we manage patients with coronary disease. And why is that? It's because myocardial perfusion imaging over the years uh, has remained a critical tool in CAD management for uh, three reasons. One, it is accurate, it is reproducible, and most importantly, it is a marker of clinical risk. Um, there is, there's been uh, much data published, including data from your own institution, John Mamari and Mario Varani and Moaz Almola have published extensively on this topic, showing uh, clearly that um, uh, the presence of a normal perfusion scan identifies patients at low clinical risk and the uh, extent of uh, uh, perfusion abnormalities associated with increased risk in, in almost a linear manner. However, we've seen changes uh, over time, particularly the last decade. We have witnessed a uh, burgeoning of uh, techniques for evaluation of patients with suspected coronary disease. Uh, and in particular, we've seen the rise of cardiac CT, of coronary CT angiography. And this is an incredibly powerful test uh, particularly because of its sensitivity and negative predictive value for excluding coronary artery disease. Um, and not only that, it gives us the opportunity to really quantify atherosclerotic burden and using that uh, quantitative um, measure, we can guide management uh, of uh, patients with suspected disease uh, in terms of preventive medications in particular that have been recently associated with improvements in clinical outcomes. So clearly, testing options for patients with stable chest pain have changed over the years. And uh, we currently have <clears throat> essentially agreement that patients at the very low end of the risk spectrum probably won't need any testing, uh, just uh, preventive and uh, medications and management of risk factors. And patients at the very high uh, end of the risk spectrum will probably need to be referred for coronary angiography. The field of nuclear cardiology and myocardial perfusion imaging has been essentially focused in primarily in the patients with low intermediate risk for the most part. But with the um, evolution of testing, we've seen a shift uh, in patients that uh, are referred for perfusion imaging in more of a high risk category in sort of the intermediate risk uh, 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 and high spectrum uh, with patients in the low risk, either going to exercise treadmill or uh, stress echo or now uh, more importantly, cardiac CT. And this scheme of uh, uh, you know, utilization of testing has been recently supported by uh, clinical guidelines. At least the Europeans uh, support uh, this uh, basic scheme on how to use testing for patients with stable chest pain. So by now you're wondering, well, I came here for listen to PET. So when are we going to get into that? Well, it was important for me to give you that foundation uh, and now give you the rationale for why I think the future of nuclear cardiology will be uh, 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 PET uh, uh, or a big part of the future will be quantitative PET imaging. And let me tell you the reasons why I think that's gonna be the case. Reason number one is uh, we have seen a temporal decline in the prevalence of obstructive coronary disease. This is a large uh, 
European Registry of Patients with Angina Referred for Coronary Angiography. And as you can see, in both male and female, there's been a steady increase in the prevalence of non-obstructive atherosclerosis as a primary cause of explaining chest pain. Very similar data has been now recently published from the uh, Olmsted County in Minnesota, uh, showing a steady decline in the probability of any coronary disease, particularly obstructive disease, over the course of the last 20 years. And this is perhaps the reason why many of our clinical algorithms uh, that we used to uh, use for predicting the likelihood that someone might have obstructive disease when they have symptoms have really been uh, changing. And the accuracy of those algorithms are now uh, known to be uh, off and in many instances significantly overestimate the prevalence of in addition to the decline in obstructive disease, we're also seeing changes in the way patients present uh, when they have uh, coronary disease. We've seen a steady decline in type 1 myocardial infarction and a steady rise in secondary causes of myocardial infarction associated with heart failure, with atrial fibrillation, with chronic kidney disease, and with even uh, type 2 diabetes. And you can see that type 2 myocardial infarction, as you know, is associated with higher risk uh, than patients with a classic atherothrombotic uh, occlusion, uh, for whom we have good treatments now for the last uh, 20 years. We thought that these uh, type 2 myocardial infarction, these uh, injuries that result from increased demand, where a substrate of patients uh, older, um, of older individuals with diffuse atherosclerosis, but we're now seeing that this uh, type two myocardial infarction, uh, you know, is really uh, also um, uh, present in patients with uh, young infarcts. You know, patients. This is a registry from Ron Blankstein showing the prevalence of type two myocardial infarction in patients who suffer an MI at an age younger than 50. And this doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in the context of changes in the epidemiology of cardio cardiometabolic risk factors, particularly diabetes, obesity, and coronary, uh, chronic kidney disease. We now know that based on recent statistics from the American Heart Association, one in four patients over the age of 65 is a diabetic. One in three is pre-diabetic. One in two patients are either overweight or obese. And almost 40% of patients over the age of 65 have chronic kidney disease. And all of this is important because together with the decline in uh, the rate of obstructive coronary disease angiographically, there is now recognition that much of the presentation of these patients that have ischemia by symptoms, but no evidence of obstructive disease, there are two anatomic patterns uh, that we're gonna have to uh, reckon with. One is diffuse atherosclerosis in the epicardial coronaries, as well as microvascular disease as the primary anatomic signatures of ischemic heart disease in this population. As you can see, uh, because of the rise in this uh, uh, diffuse athro and microvascular disease, the techniques that we use that are relying on the presence of obstructive disease for detection and stratification of risk uh, are really not going to help us very much because these areas of ischemia are going to be diffuse in the heart and relatively invisible for techniques that rely on the presence of a single perfusion abnormality. And this is why PET will offer great power to really tackle these challenges. Uh, PET offers the ability to look at focal disease, to assess ventricular function, not only at rest, but during peak stress, unlike SPECT. 
because most of our PET scanners come with CT, we can assess atherosclerotic burden. And importantly, we can quantify myocardial perfusion, which is the single most important um, um, uh, uh, attribute of PET that makes it, that makes it unique. Uh, we can look at changes in radioactivity concentration throughout the um, uh, time, and we can construct time activity curves, which allow us to quantify myocardial blood flow in milliliters per minute per gram and uh, during rest and during stress. And from these ratios, we can calculate coronary flow reserve, which integrates all these aspects of coronary atherosclerosis, including the presence of focal disease, the presence of diffuse disease and microvascular dysfunction in a single measure of perfusion um, uh, severity that allows us to not only make diagnosis, but as I show you, uh, also look at quantification. So the comprehensive assessment of PET scanning allows us to look at focal disease by delineating the presence of a perfusion defect, look at ventricular function, assess the atherosclerotic burden, and looking at diffuse disease and microvascular disease in ways we weren't able to do with conventional uh, SPECT imaging. So how is this impacting the field of coronary disease management? Well, um, the basic as, uh, one of the basic concepts is whether these measures of coronary blood flow and coronary flow reserve allow us to add, uh, you know, uncover the presence of stenosis severity. Work from Lance Gould uh, almost 50 years ago demonstrated that uh, um, coronary stenosis and myocardial blood flow and flow reserve have a nonlinear relationship such that with increasing stenosis severity, there is gradual reduction in coronary flow reserve at the expense of uh, exhausting the autoregulatory mechanisms. Um, when you actually uh, think about this, then we can use these measures of coronary flow reserve to uncover areas of myocardial perfusion abnormalities that may not be um, necessarily evident on visual inspection. Here's a 68 year old male with hypertension and diabetes who presented with atypical angina. You can see uh, his myocardial perfusion scan showing clearly a perfusion defect with reversibility here, here evident on the polar map um, uh, involving the circumflex territory. When you actually look at his uh, coronary blood flow and flow reserve, you can appreciate then not only you can see um, you know, a clear abnormality in the flow in the area of the perfusion deficit, but you can also see that the LAD and RCA territories are also severely abnormal. Uh, and uh, this will uh, uh, suggest that this patient may have more extensive angiographic disease. As you can see here on the angiogram, uh, the flow was able to uncover areas of balanced ischemia that were not uh, clearly evident on the perfusion scan. So the perfusion scan did not miss disease. The patient was clearly identified as a patient with disease, but it clearly underestimated the extent of abnormality. And now with the flow uh, data, we can clearly identify that this is not a low intermediate risk patient. This is a really high risk patient, uh, as you can see here on the angiogram. So it gives us a boost of sensitivity uh, for uncovering extensive coronary disease. Not only can we improve sensitivity, but we can also improve confidence when we're reading scans. This is a 57 year old female with multiple risk factors. You can see type two diabetes, hypertension, family history of premature disease with atypical chest pain. She has a normal myocardial perfusion scan, but the uh, CT transmission scan shows that she has incredibly dense calcifications here in the LAD and in the right coronary artery. And so the question is, does this patient have a uh, balanced ischemia that may not be apparent on the myocardial perfusion scan? When you look at the flow data, you clearly see that she's able to augment myocardial blood flow normally 
uh, we typically want to see this number above two mLs per minute per gram. And you can see that her flow reserve is above two, which places her um, at a low risk for uh, obstructive disease. Uh, in fact, there is a um, growing number of uh, papers showing that when your flow reserve is normal, your negative predictive value for excluding high risk obstructive disease is incredibly high. Uh, and you pretty much, you virtually cannot have critical disease with normal augmentation of myocardial blood flow. So it becomes a very powerful measure uh, uh, that improves confidence that when we're uh, evaluating this patient, we're not missing significant disease. This has been uh, borne out also in multiple meta-analysis. This is one of them showing that quantitative PET shows uh, significantly uh, improved sensitivity and specificity compared to SPECT imaging and uh, echocardiography. And now in the most recent iteration of the Pacific trial analysis, PET was uh, one of the most uh, powerful uh, ways in which we could uh, diagnose uh, and identify flow limiting coronary disease, including comparing to the fractional flow reserve with CT. So there's data suggesting that our diagnostic assessments become more accurate uh, and more useful uh, when incorporating blood flow abnormality. In terms of diagnosis, we've also learned uh, that many patients with symptoms uh, of angina and ischemia may not have obstructive coronary disease, like the example shown here. Uh, this patient has diffuse atherosclerosis, has normal myocardial perfusion, but has a moderate reduction in the um, um, uh, blood flow augmentation uh, you can see that the stress flows are moderately reduced and the flow reserve is mild to moderately reduced, indicating the presence of um, uh, the presence of microvascular disease as the likely cause of symptoms. So uh, not only can we um, rule in the presence of obstructive disease, but we also have the ability to really diagnose microvascular disease. And guidelines now suggest that PET is um, probably the test of choice for this particular application. This presence of microvascular disease and non-obstructive atherosclerosis, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, is becoming a more common problem in the patients over the age of 65 with multiple cardiometabolic risk factors. This is data from our own lab published a few years ago showing that in both uh, women and men presenting with um, symptoms of chest pain or dyspnea, uh, but no evidence of overt obstructive disease, 50% 50, 50 approximately for both groups uh, will have uh, evidence of impaired coronary vasoreactivity indicating the presence of um, uh, impaired perfusion in the heart, partly due to diffuse atherosclerosis, partly due to microvascular disease. And more importantly, when that syndrome is present, those patients are associated with high risk. So this is now going to be, as I mentioned, one of the ways in which we can more ref uh, we can refine our assessments of risk. Other applications of quantitative perfusion are in the area of transplant vasculopathy. And this is a diffuse process. As you know, coronary angiography has been the main stem for diagnosing these patients, but this is evolving. And now there's a clear recognition that the diffuse nature of transplant vasculopathy is probably more amenable to quantitative blood flow uh, measurements. There's data showing that uh, this may be a very effective test, both in terms of sensitivity, negative predictive value and warranty. Uh, for the annual evaluation of patients uh, after heart transplantation. So we talked a lot about diagnosis, but then what about prognosis? Uh, 
the basic principles of myocardial perfusion PET are identical to the principles that we use uh, for SPECT imaging. So it is not a surprise uh, that uh, the, the extent and the severity of perfusion abnormalities that one can detect with PET imaging has the same beautiful risk stratification that we have learned to see uh, with SPECT imaging. Patients with normal scans have a very, very low risk, and patients with severely abnormal scans um, have a uh, severely increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events. This is uh, applicable to both uh, women and men equally. But what about flow? What does flow contribute to this um, uh, assessment of risk? We now have growing data from multiple laboratories using different tracers and different ways to quantify myocardial blood flow, showing basically the same uh, inconsistent fact that uh, there is a uh, stepwise increase in risk with a reduction in coronary flow reserve uh, as you can see here in these multiple studies from involving almost 20,000 patients now published within the last uh, five to 10 years. What is interesting is that the improvement in risk stratification occurs uh, throughout the spectrum of risk. Here you have patients with no ischemia, here 0%. Uh, to patients with more than 10% ischemic myocardium. Here you have annualized cardiac mortality. And from front to back, you have tertiles of coronary flow reserve. Upper tertile reflecting normal flow reserve and lower tertile reflecting severely reduced flow reserve less than 1.5. And you can see that at any strata of uh, ischemic risk, uh, patients with diffusely abnormal coronary flow reserve will have a significantly higher risk, including for patients who have no evidence of perfusion abnormalities um, that I mentioned uh, before. So it provides a refinement of our risk stratification. Uh, we are getting uh, even more sophisticated and including both the coronary flow reserve as well as the maximal augmentation of stress flows. In, uh, and we've learned from Dr. Gould that this concept of coronary flow capacity incorporating the flow reserve and the maximal flow reserve allows you to uh, dis uh, distinguish um, different buckets of clinical risk. You have two concordant groups. Here are patients with severely reduced maximal flow and severely reduced flow reserve were clearly the highest risk group. Many of these patients have extensive obstructive coronary disease. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have patients with normal flow and normal flow reserve, clearly the lowest risk group. And then you have two discordant groups. Uh, this group here that has reduced stress flow, but flow reserve is relatively preserved. These are patients primarily male with non-obstructive uh, uh, diffuse atherosclerosis who are able to uh, maintain their coronary flow reserve. You can see that their risk is uh, slightly about uh, lower than 1% a year. And these are primarily women with normal augmentation of stress flow, but reduced flow reserve at the expense of increased resting flow, which uh, we thought were low risk, but clearly they're more in the intermediate risk category. We are not sure we understand exactly the substrate, but many people have adjudicated this to microvascular disease, and we can discuss that later. Uh, the flow and the calcium that we measure are uh, uh, have a strong prognostic interplay. And you can see that uh, doc, you've learned this already from Dr. Mamarian in his uh, landmark study showing how calcium scoring uh, improves the risk stratification of uh, myocardial perfusion spect. This is another um, uh, uh, advancement on this uh, by showing that uh, at different levels of calcium scoring, a normal flow reserve identifies patients at low risk. Uh, 
Uh, and these are patients with normal myocardial perfusion scans. So, um, so it does provide incremental risk gratification, even in patients with normal scan and high calcium scores. Now, one of the reasons uh, that um, uh, I think quantitative flow is a way to the future for risk gratification is the fact uh, that in higher risk patients with advanced cardiometabolic disease here, including diabetes, and this work from Dr. Almala in chronic kidney uh, disease, showing that you can still obtain beautiful risk stratification when the scan is normal and abnormal. But you can see that even when the scan is normal, uh, those patients are not necessarily low risk individuals. And this notion of underestimation of risk in the setting of a normal myocardial perfusion scan had been uh, debated over the years. And people have said, well, risk is contextual. And therefore, those patients have increasing risk factors and must have higher risk despite the absence of coronary disease. But another explanation for that is the fact that because many of these patients have diffuse disease and microvascular disease, is the looking for the regional perfusion defect is just not going to give us the opportunity to really uncover risk. And it's only through quantification of flow that we're able to do that. So here are two examples of patients with diabetes, both have normal myocardial perfusion scans. And if one uh, looks at the prognostic data, we would say, well, both are probably associated with low risk, but we now incorporating uh, the uh, flow data, you say, well, this patient on the top has normal vasoreactivity with augmentation of flow and normal flow reserve but this patient has severely reduced flows and severely reduced flow reserve. And now with the flow data, we can uh, really reclassify the risk of these patients with normal perfusion scan with the patient in the bottom uh, showing presumably higher risk. And this has been shown by Venk Murthy uh, work uh, when he was working with us showing that in patients with diabetes without overt coronary disease, uh, the presence of a relatively normal uh, my, uh, myocardial flow reserve uh, associates with incredibly low risk and is in those patients where the flow reserve, this measure of vascular health is abnormal, when we see increased risk of uh, cardiovascular uh, mortality uh, such that these patients without known disease but impaired flow reserve behave like those with coronary disease, prior myocardial infarction or revascularization who are not diabetics. And perhaps this is the true CAD risk equivalent of diabetes because we are providing a direct measurement of vascular health. Similar data uh, uh, has been shown in chronic kidney disease, a very challenging uh, area because of the increases in diffuse atherosclerosis and microvascular disease. This is work from uh, David Chariton and Nishan Shah showing uh, similar risk stratification, improvements in risk stratification uh, across the spectrum of chronic kidney disease. One thing that I learned also from CT is that it provides incremental value for identifying high-risk patients. As you can see, this is a patient that came to our center a number of years ago for a PET scan. And we discovered through the CT that the patient was had a gun. Um, and so clearly we uh, thought this is a uh, proof that CT can really identify high risk. But now more seriously, uh, going back to all the subgroups that have been studied with quantitative flow, we can tell you that the incorporation of coronary flow reserve measurements to a risk assessment allows us to identify the true low risk individuals amongst those who are already higher clinical risk. And remember what I said at the beginning, this is going to be the dominant place for nuclear cardiology is going to be in patients with uh, enhanced cardiometabolic risk at the intermediate and high uh, end of the spectrum. And so we're gonna need these powerful tools to be able to um, uh, 
um, uh, refine our ability to identify truly high and truly low risk individuals. Let me give you a few additional insights uh, uh, into what we can do with flow. Uh, you know, we are uh, now getting into pathophysiology of coronary uh, 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 ischemic heart disease. And, you know, we've learned that all of the constellation of risk factors lead to diffuse atherosclerosis disease. And this sets up a cascade of abnormalities that begin with subendocardial ischemia, subclinical injury in the heart that can be evident by leaks in troponin uh, levels, evident in CKD and diabetes, for example. And this in turn leads to diffuse fibrosis and alteration of myocardial mechanics, which ultimately lead to symptoms and events. And um, uh, over the last few years, we're learning about this interrelationship between all these elements that I think are uh, enhancing our ability to understand why flow may be a risk marker. And also it gives us uh, markers of risk that may be useful in clinical trials and research. Uh, this is data uh, from uh, Nav uh, Bajaj uh, showing um, powerful associations between mechanical function here, peak GLS and diastolic function measurements as a function of myocardial flow reserve. And importantly, what he was able to show in this study is that uh, patients uh, with uh, uh, ventricular, uh, uh, you know, abnormal remodeling uh, in the absence of coronary, uh, obstructive coronary disease, develop a higher risk of events once they begin to develop micro, uh, you know, abnormalities in coronary blood flow, indicating um, that um, uh, the transition from sort of a compensated or a state of LV remodeling to uh, more of a maladaptive remodeling that leads to heart failure and type two myocardial infarction. This is data also uh, similar that has been shown by Viviani Tichetti, uh, showing that the interaction of uh, abnormal flow and abnormal diastolic function uh, is pretty powerful to identify patients at high risk for heart failure admissions. Again, these are patients without obstructive coronary artery disease. And more recently, we've shown that the sim similar paradigm can be used in patients with hypertensive heart disease by looking particularly at those patients with adaptive remodeling. We can see that flow reserve gives us a potential target. It, it's per perhaps becoming uh, a metric of end organ damage that may be quite useful uh, in evaluation in research and potentially uh, in clinical practice. We're also interested now in incorporating these measures of vascular health in patients with systemic inflammatory disorders and uh, the same paradigm uh, that we've seen in other conditions is also present here, uh, patients uh, with reduced flow reserve um, uh, are at higher risk of uh, adverse cardiovascular events. And now we're using these measurements to really evaluate response to therapy as a way to study mechanisms of inflammation on the heart, but also perhaps as a way to identify the patients who may be um, uh, at uh, who may be uh, at the higher end of the benefit for therapies that are not necessarily inexpensive or not necessarily without risk. So we're thinking that the future role of myocardial blood flow may be not so much in guiding revascularization, but also in the evaluation of medical management, particularly when we're thinking of therapies many of which are injectables, many of which are biologics uh, that are not necessarily without risk, and many of which, which are very expensive. So perhaps identification of the patients with diffuse atherosclerosis and abnormal vascular health might actually help us identify um, the biggest um, uh, group, the group with the potentially highest uh, clinical benefit. Finally, a few opportunities and some challenges. Uh, 
PET not only will allow us to uh, look at flow, but you can see that by looking at the transit of the bolus through the heart, we can now quantify uh, uh, you know, transit time. Uh, we can look at cardiopulmonary transit time. We can look at right ventricular function the way we used to do it with first pass imaging and then quantification of myocardial blood flow potentially in the right ventricle. Now, from the new development standpoint, uh, uh, we're beginning to use not only the average flow reserve in a, in a vascular territory, this is a patient that clearly has a fixed defect in the lateral wall, perhaps a suggestion that there is a perfusion abnormality here in the distal apex. Uh, and what we're beginning to do is measurement of gradients. Um, we've learned that fractional flow reserve is the gradient of pressure between the distal and the proximal part of the coronaries. And because pressure and flow in, in a patient with maximal vasodilation are linearly related, we can now look at ratios between flow um, in the distal part of the heart and the proximal as a proxy uh, for pressure and calculate these gradients that in this particular individual, you can see that there was a gradient uh, that led to a PET FFR of 0.76. So these measurements of fractional flow reserve will allow us to refine our ability to differentiate diffuse atherosclerosis from diffuse obstructive disease, one of the key elements uh, in terms of specificity for flow. And, and this will allow us to distinguish perhaps these phenotypes of patients with predominantly focal disease, predominantly mixed disease, you know, focal and diffuse, and differentiating them from diffuse disease. And you can see that these patients have a very different pressure profile on these pullback measurements of fractional flow reserve in the cath lab. Uh, and uh, Dr. Gould has been pioneering this, showing that similar shapes of um, gradients can be used with PET imaging and flow quantification to perhaps identify the different uh, phenotypes present and be able to identify patients that may benefit most from revascularization. Ultimately, where we're headed with this is to try to improve our ability to identify patients that may benefit from revascularization particularly in light of the results of the ischemia trial, flow may become even more important. Uh, you can see here that um, in this pilot data, over 300 patients, Viviani Takedi showed that it's not just the patient with severe ischemia in a single vessel territory, but it's, it's the patient with single vessel uh, or uh, single vessel abnormality who also have severely reduced global flow reserve, the one that will benefit most from revascularization. And, and this will perhaps help us in that regard. And even more important is data from this group in Kansas City, Dr. Tim Bateman show clearly an interaction between perfusion defects involving here 10% of the heart uh, and you can see that only in the setting of a, re a globally reduced flow reserve are the patients who benefit from early revascularization. Patients with more than 10%, but globally uh, preserved or relatively preserved flow reserve will not benefit. So this will perhaps give us an opportunity to really refine our selection uh, for uh, revascularization. So in summary, PET is uh, one of the most powerful tests across the spectrum of CAD risk. Uh, in, uh, the data suggests that it is the most accurate test, especially in intermediate heart risk patients, those with extensive cardiometabolic disease. Clearly, flow quantification is its biggest strength and uh, improves not only diagnostic accuracy, but more importantly, risk stratification across the spectrum of disease, not only in the setting of obstructive disease, but more importantly, in the setting of diffuse disease and microvascular disease. And recent data supports its potential role in patient selection for revascularization. We'll have to see prospective studies in this regard, but I think the initial proof of concept data is there 
and it's very exciting. So I really uh, thank you all for your kind attention. And I want to acknowledge uh, my extensive group of collaborators uh, uh, at the Brigham with the cardiovascular division, with many areas in the Department of Medicine and outside of the Brigham, including uh, my colleagues at MGH throughout the US, including Dr. Almala, uh, my international colleagues, and last but not least, my dear mentors, Dr. Shelbert, Madahi, uh, Beller, and Libby, who have been uh, really, truly uh, inspirational and uh, guided me throughout my career. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Marcelo, for an outstanding grand round and uh, overview of where PET fits in in 2021 in the management of patients with known or suspected coronary disease. And we're receiving a few questions from the audience. So I'll start with one question from Dr. Zalbi. He says, thank you, Marcelo, for a great overview of PET. If both SPECT and PET are available for pharmacologic CED evaluation, should most patients be referred to PET? How do you choose and how do we decide which ones are still appropriate for SPECT? Yeah, so I, I think that if, a pay, if both techniques are available and the patient will not exercise at all, um, clearly having more data uh, which PET will offer in terms of quantitative flow will help us. And, and we have to remember that the patients who cannot exercise are precisely those in, in whom PET will actually be most useful. Diabetics, chronic kidney disease, patients with extensive comorbidities, um, so clearly, that's the group where more is better. Um, and, you know, if, if, uh, younger patients who can exercise, you know, uh, and perhaps lower risk, um, you know, I think SPECT will still be a very important adjunct to our uh, evaluation with CT coronary angiography. Uh, I'm not really sure which test we're going to do first. Uh, but clearly, exercise will remain an important part of the evaluation, and uh, SPECT imaging will remain a strong um, technique uh, that can complement that uh, atherosclerotic assessment with CT. Excellent. Hello, John, you wanna... Sorry, go ahead, John. Marcelo, fantastic talk. Really enjoyed it. And I would just like to open the discussion a little bit with a few questions. Um, so when we read PET studies here, we use a lot of different uh, prognostic indicators. Obviously, we look at the perfusion. We looked at the flow. We also look at peak uh, response to uh, pharmacologic stress in terms of injection fraction. Right. And you really didn't mention that, although your group has actually published quite a bit on that. And I think it's uh, in terms of talking about both prognosis and diagnosis, I mean, your group pretty much showed that if you augment the ejection fraction or lack of augmentation is a very good predictor of multivessel disease. And so I, I want to get your feelings in terms of what you use to try to predict multivessel disease and where ejection fraction fits in. Because as you already said, the positive predictive value of abnormal flow is very low because many things mm -hmm. affect flow besides epicardial disease. So how do you right. use PPF? Well, I, I think, uh, thank you, John. And I think that's a very, uh, it, you know, I, I, it, at one point I had to begin to cut slides because I had too many. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and, and as you pointed out, uh, ejection fraction is a very important measure uh, that gives us uh, uh, essentially no cost additional risk data that I think we must look at. Um, I have to say that how do we use it? Um, when everything fits in, you know, you have severely reduced flow reserve, the EF drops, and uh, even if you have a small perfusion defect, then we're pretty comfortable saying that's truly a high-risk patient that needs to be evaluated with coronary angiography. But I have to say that uh, if you have, for example, no perfusion defects, your EF drops and your flow reserve is abnormal, that's still a high risk patient. Uh, the data, um, I would say um, the, the way I view the 
ejection fraction data is very similar to the specificity that you get with echocardiography. You know, when you see a drop in ejection fraction, you know that the amount of ischemia is much more severe. So I think it's a spectrum, uh, you know, in the sort of, if only you have reductions in flow, but your EF is still sort of blunted or slightly increased, well, that's an increased risk, but not the highest risk patient because we're still not at the level that we have induced subendocardial ischemia for a drop in ejection fraction. So I think it's a continuum. And uh, I think it's important to integrate both um, the reduction in flow without a drop in ejection fraction. I think it's a lower risk category than when both are abnormal. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think issue... it's incredibly rare to see. Uh, well, I haven't seen a patient that drops the EF without a drop in flow. So I think flow comes first, and then you see the subendocardial ischemia that leads to a drop in ejection fraction. So I think it gives you a spectrum of severity, I guess. I like guess one other issue that and and got you you all post on this too is the issue of calcium scoring because you had the, the the ability to see at the time in people without known disease whether they have a calcium score of fifteen hundred or whether they have a calcium score of zero. Absolutely. So that would be also a predictor of who you might send to the cath lab. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, you know, but the flow gives you one opportunity there. Uh, that is one step beyond the wonderful data that you published a number of years ago with SPECT imaging uh, that, you know, say you have a patient with very high calcium score, but normal SPECT. Um, is that patient truly high risk because it has diffuse obstructive disease or it's just because a patient that has a lot of atherosclerosis? And so when you look at the flow, you can at least exclude the possibility of a severely obstructive disease if your flow is normal. Uh, clearly, it's a higher risk patient, but not someone that you'd be keen in going to the cath lab because you're concerned about obstructive disease. So there's a lot of interplay between the flow, the calcium, and of course, the ventricular function. And I guess, again, just to bring up another point is that if someone has a normal, perfu a normal perfusion study on PED, normal flow reserve and a calcium score of 1500, I think, and this data I don't think is really available yet, but I think that would indicate maybe higher long-term risk, but low short-term risk. And I think that would be very intriguing to see in long-term studies. Yeah, the, the way we have interpreted uh, the, re you know, basically if you have 1500 calcium score, but your flow reserve is normal, it already cuts your risk in half. And the way we think about that is the flow gives you um, a handle on how much activity there is on that disease leading to endothelial dysfunction and vascular dysfunction. And the calcium gives you the burden of atherosclerosis. So, so when both are abnormal, of course, that's the worst case scenario, but it, it's similar to data that have been published uh, with CRP and calcium score, right? Uh, patients with normal CRP but high calcium have a relatively low risk. So the way, it, you know, I, so I think there's pathophysiologically, I think the flow gives you a handle on the disease activity more than the disease burden. Yeah, okay. And I have one other uh, question before we go on to other questions is um, what about myocardial flow reserve in people who have been previously revascularized? Yeah, so I think that's that that continues to be a challenge, particularly if you were revascularized with cabbage. Um, and, and part of the reason for the, you know, we, we don't know in exactly why the flow reserve is low, even when you have no ischemia, uh, but presumably is related to the fact that the epicardial vessels get heavily calcified following revascularizations. And, you know, re coronary resistance is primarily at the microvascular level, but it's not exclusively at the microvascular level. And still 20 to 30% of your coronary resistance reside in your epicardial vessels. So if the epicardial vessels become heavily calcified, you will see that your flow augmentation is not gonna be as good 
as in patients who have normal coronary physiology. So, um, so the issue of how to use this in cabbage is still evolving. I would say uh, in practice, we don't incorporate, we try not to incorporate measures of coronary flow reserve or flow in the evaluation of cabbage patients because there's still a lot we don't understand. And we really, I mean, when we say the patient has no perfusion defect, has, uh, um, you know, uh, normal ventricular function, the EF rises, and your flow reserve is abnormal, say, what does that mean? And do I need to worry about that? And so I think it, it at the moment, um, you know, it's not clear what to do with that. But uh, for PCI, though, uh, PCI does not have the same effect, and, and uh, the data is pretty effective, uh, you know, following PCI. So I think uh, revascularization with cabbage continues to be an area that uh, we need to do more work to understand at least what are the thresholds for abnormality. Maybe the thresholds are lower. Great. Moaz, you are muted. But the presence of normal flow in patients with cabbage is somehow like reassuring yeah. in these patients. But it's reassuring. Uh, that's true. But it is often not normal. Uh, and so the question is what to do with that. Uh, so so if it's normal, it's good. We feel, we feel very confident about that. Yeah. So, so one more question that comes, sorry, John, uh, all the time from our referring clinicians is like, okay, so now I have somebody with abnormal flow. There's no obstructive coronary disease, no perfusion defect. How do I treat them? And this is kind of like beyond, most of the time, these patients are already on aspirin, statin, ACE inhibitors, and we're trying to control their lipids and uh, the hemoglobin A1Cs and others. And if it's a John mammarian patient, his LDL is going to be like below 20 or 30. <laughs> so the question yeah. is, how do you treat them? I mean, you already exhausted your treatment emanation there. Well, uh, I think John is doing the right thing. You know, So if we think about flow, uh, a consequence of atherosclerosis could be obstructive, could be non-obstructive, could be endothelial dysfunction at the microvascular level. I think treating aggressively atherosclerosis becomes, uh, you know, it, very intuitive, right? With aggressive lipid lowering, um, control of the risk factors. You know, if you have someone uh, with an LDL of 20, but the hemoglobin A1C is uh, 10, uh, you know, I think we're not, I think we're losing the battle there because we're not controlling all the factors that will lead to those abnormalities. Same is true, you know, you have a patient with a BMI of 49 and, uh, and, and has you know, somewhat it's young, somewhat limited, uh, the lipids are relatively okay, but, you know, there's a lot more inflammation that occurs in these patients. So unless we manage that morbid obesity, uh, I, I don't think we have any hope that we will be able to improve that. So I think we cannot forget about management of the risk factors. And then assuming that we did everything we could, uh, what else can we do to improve that? And I think it will depend on the situation. For example, if you have a patient with hypertensive heart disease, an older lady, um, John did a calcium score is zero. Uh, her heart is small, hypercontractile, her coronaries are all coiled. You know, you know, this is hypertensive heart disease. The flow is abnormal. You know, will following John advice to lower the LDL to less than 20 be the right way to go? Well, you know, maybe she needs that, but I don't think it will impact the flow because the mechanism for flow reduction in that individual is likely due to um, endothelial dysfunction related to her hypertensive heart disease. And so perhaps drugs that are directed to managing that, I think are going to be important. Everyone else, and this is why it's so important to have a handle on the extent of atherosclerosis because microvascular disease is rarely presenting in a vacuum. 80, 90% of patients with microvascular disease have epicardial atherosclerosis. And so you know that microvascular disease is a manifestation 
of atherosclerosis that doesn't present with an atheroma. It presents with a different structural and functional abnormality. And so managing aggressively atherosclerosis is going to be the future. You know, newer drugs, for example, SGLT2 inhibitors may have not a flow improvement, but perhaps in the way the cells are able to handle oxygen. You know, uh, many of these patients with HEPF that are now potentially benefiting from SGLT2s have normal flows. These are women, normal flows. And you say, well, you know, what's the problem? Is not the delivery of oxygen, is perhaps the way the myocyte is able to handle oxygen and is more of an energetics issue more than a flow problem. So I think we're, it's an exciting time. And I think PET will allow us to investigate many of these mechanistic uh, um, uh, issues uh, with the powerful drugs that we have, but we need to use them smartly. Um, yeah. And one more last question in relation to what we have right now in the spirit of the pandemic. Can we use PET myocardial flow reserve to detect long-term follow-up in patients who have myocardial injury from COVID? Or like, and this is one of the mechanisms that we suggest yeah. myocardial injury. Very, very interesting area for investigation. Uh, the answer is we don't know. Uh, but... Uh, many, many of the published evidence suggests that there is an endothelitis at the microvascular level that is prothrombotic. So clearly, uh, you know, uh, these patients will have in the acute phase more uh, complications for thrombotic complications, both in terms of uh, myocardial infarction, but also um, uh, other forms of, uh, but in the chronic phase, it may lead to alterations in, 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 the, in terms of um, function of the small vessels, but also in terms of structure. Uh, in, and I think looking at flow quantification may be an answer to um, work up patients that present with chest pain in the chronic phase of the disease for whom we have no answers because you know, they don't have obstructive atherosclerosis. So I think it's it's an interesting, intriguing hypothesis. I think um, we we started a registry in our own place, uh, but we haven't been able to make a lot of headway because we need funding. So if you know of sources, I'm happy to team up with you and uh, and pull together patients in this area. Sure. Yeah, we can. Oh, I just have one other question before we wrap up, and that's... Uh, in the patient, let's say 65-year-old uh, woman, maybe a history of hypertension, some diastolic dysfunction, sent for PET because of shortness of breath, maybe as an, as an equivalent of CAD. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you, or how would you use myocardial blood flow to maybe think about amyloid doses, since that's now becoming more and more of an issue, especially with yeah. new treatments available? I, I think very interesting question. Um, uh, you know, very recently we got a patient, an older patient uh, that had intra intractable atrial fibrillation. Um, somehow they did an echo, but they sort of missed the fact that the patient had some typical features of amyloid on the echocardiogram. But when it came for the PET scan, was just looking for coronary disease and the flow abnormalities were profoundly abnormal. It was just like very severely reduced flow reserve. But then we looked at the contractility and we saw exactly what you see on the echo that was relative apical sparing of the contractile function and very severe abnormalities at the base. We said, we don't think, it, you know, and the patient had TID, had all of these phenomena that were related to microvascular disease and you know, PYP was strongly positive following that up. So um, I think flow alterations alone will not be sufficient to really make a diagnosis of infiltrative uh, cardiomyopathy. And you're going to need necessarily, you know, the flow abnormality in the right context of an abnormal, uh, you know, echo, for example, or MRI will give you um, 
you know, pretty confident, uh, pretty good confidence that you're really dealing with infiltrative cardiomyopathy and microvascular disease that relates to that disease. Um, but if you find it in isolation without any other data, I think the specificity for infiltrated heart disease is going to be low. Um, you know, and, right. you know, remember that you see microvascular disease in the advanced stages of infiltration, not in the early stages of the disease. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Well, that has been wonderful and we're almost beyond our time. So would like to thank you very much, Marcelo, for being with us this morning. Great grand rounds. And on behalf of myself, John and Bill and everyone at the Houston Methodist Baker Heart and Vascular Center, we want to thank you for a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to visiting you in the next few years. We look forward. Thank you so much, Marcelo. All right. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.